Okay. Welcome to Gold Scratch. So I haven't made a video for a long time. Uh, back in the spring, I've just been busy with other things in the summer. Uh, Trevor Calder Motorsports kept me kind of busy and uh, had other interests during the summer. But I have a particular reason to get back to work. And the title of this video is going to be The Almighty 427. And I'm pretty excited about it, so that's why. I'm going to actually make three videos. One right now, I'm all ready to start assembling it. Uh, when I get it running on my engine test stand, I'll make another video. And then they're off to Waters Dyno service in Springfield, Ontario uh, to dyno it. So I'll make a video of that as well. So, so what's the background of this? When I was growing up, if you were uh, in my cohort group growing up in the 1960s, which was a pretty Cool time to be growing up if you're a car guy. It was the beginning of the muscle car era. In fact, the very first muscle car officially was a 1964 Pontiac GTO. And 19, yeah, 64. And 64 was also the same year that I got my driver's license and started working at a Texaco service station. So I kind of grew with the, with the muscle cars at that time. So it was pretty fun. So back in that day, 427 was the holy grail of engines. It was the biggest, most powerful engine that you could buy. Uh, and uh, if anybody had one, they would get uh, immediate respect. And so what's the history of that? Um, in the early 60s, GM and Chevrolet were trying to compete with the NASCAR, and the 427 was inspired by NASCAR. Trying to compete with the, the almighty Hemi that Chrysler had and the 427 Ford and all they had to compete with it was the 409 and as much as the 409 is an iconic engine and i love them i have built two of them uh they weren't doing very well against the Hemi. so they had to do something and this was the smoky unit era of racing and in 1965 in nascar appeared what was called the mystery engine and that was actually a 396 so a 396 and a 427 are essentially the same engine. A 427 has a four and a quarter inch bore and a 396 has around four and eighth inch bore. Otherwise, they're identical. They have the same crankshaft, same connected rods, and almost all the other parts are the same. So uh, the 427 was born in 65 and the 409 became immediately obsolete as far as a racing motor goes. And uh, the 396 turned into a 427 and in 1966 was the first year you could buy one from Chevrolet and the only way you could get one was to buy a Corvette back in the day. Uh, GM always wanted their biggest most powerful engines restricted to Corvettes because people had to pay more money for them so they wanted to put those engines in cars that you couldn't get any other way so uh, if you wanted a 427 from your GM dealer that's the only way you could do it was to buy a Corvette. And they came in a 390 horse and a 425 horse in 66. And 67, they introduced the Tri Power uh, 427. And all those engines, engines are iconic today. So I've always been excited about them. Back in the 60s, I did get a chance to work on a few, uh, but I could only dream about only one. So, so how did these, these engines get in cars that weren't? Corvettes. So uh, there was two ways. Back then, the GM had what was called the COPO program. And COPO, the, the acronym stands for uh, Central Office Production Order. And if you were an executive at GM, or you had drag with one, or you had influence, you're a big time dealer, or whatever, uh, you could special order uh, cars. And one of the things you could do was substitute the for the 396, which was available with the 427. And so that's exactly what they did. And the other policy that GM had was that no pony car, thus the Camaro, the Chevelle, uh, or Nova could have more than 400 cubic inches. And this was true up until the 1970s. Uh, and so thus the SS 396 became the highest level performance car you could get. Chevrolet, had, Chevelle had one, Nova had one, and Camaro had an SS 396. And that's the biggest engine you could get at, at your regular Chevrolet dealers. 
The other way uh, was some of the big end dealers like Berger Chevrolet and Baldwin Chevrolet, Yenko in the States would actually buy the cars from GM and retrofit them themselves, put bigger engines, put headers and other modifications, suspension modifications, and then retail them. And back in the day, when I was racing my Z28 Camaro, we bought a lot of parts from Berger Chevrolet in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And if you live in Northern Ontario on the Michigan border, that's five hours away. And we made many trips to Berger Chevrolet and a lot of parts in that Camaro came from Berger Chevrolet. I remember being on their showroom floor back in the day and they would have an array of 427 Camaros and Novas. And I even saw a ZL1, which is the most iconic, the aluminum version of the 427. At that time, the retail price of a ZL1 Camaro was around $7,000 and the retail price of an L88, which is the same engine only of steel, was about half that price. So for that reason, the ZL1 didn't sell very well because nobody could afford to buy them. You could buy Corvette for the same price. Anyway, so back to the engine and let's talk about this engine. So I bought this engine from a customer uh, it used to be a high-end race engine and it had some problems and so um, he brought it to me originally to fix and we got looking into it he decided he didn't really need it he didn't have that race car anymore so I bought it off him and I'm going to build it on spec as a project and I'm converting it from a race engine to a, to a street motor so this uh, when it was a 427 with a big camshaft with a big valve springs 12 to 1 compression ratio, and what I've been told, it pushed the 3,800 pound car in the 10 second bracket. So it probably made 600 horsepower or more. And, and so I don't build those kind of engines. I build street motors for muscle cars. So I'm basically detuning it to make a nice driver that'll go in any Camaro, Chevelle, or Nova and uh, make lots of good low end torque priorities of any build, a good low end torque, drivability, maintainability, reliability, so it'll run long and, and give you a, a car that can spin the wheels at any time and uh, give you a long and happy service life. So how am I doing that? So let's start with the block. This is the most desirable block. This is a high performance passenger block, um, which was the most desirable at the time. It's a four bolt main block. It's upside down. It's not upside down right now, but there's one of the main caps off of it and as you can see uh, the, the big block Chevrolets had uh, four bolt mains on all five journals the small blocks only had them on the center journals but it's a four bolt main uh, engine so it's the most desirable block uh, to start with and of course it had 12 to 1 compression ratio so that's not good for the street so how did I fix that look we'll over here the original pistons were uh, 36 cc dome pistons and I replaced them with these Wiseco pistons, which are 21 cc's, and that brings the compression down to uh, 10 to 1. And the, the inputs into that compression calculation, 21 cc's, the, we'll talk about the heads, but the combustion chamber volume in the heads is 103 cc's, the deck height's 20 thou, and the head gaskets, I actually have two sets, one's a Kometic at 50 thou, and one is a Felpro at 39 thou, if I use the committee, it will actually be 9.9 .9 to 1 compression. If I use the uh, film Pro, it'll be 10.2 to 1 compression. These pistons are also, they're a forged piston, and they also have the 1 16th, 1 16th ring package, which is the modern way the, to get rid of uh, parasitic friction losses in an engine. The trend today is going to thinner rings, so the conventional ring would be a 5 64th ring. This is a 1 16th ring package, the top, the top and second compression rings are 1 116th inch. And I have new, of course, new uh, J rings. They're also Pro Molly file fit rings. So my good buddy Tom Winkler will be conscripted to come here again because he had up the file fit equipment to do that. He's got the little motorized automated file fit machine and we will file fit all those rings to according to specification. So, this is about as good as it gets for a street motor. Uh, they are also forged pistons. The rods are manly connecting rods, good I-beam connecting rods with ARP rod bolts. And uh, so this is a good rotating assembly. So I just, that covers the rods, the pistons, the crankshaft, 
over here is, uh, believe it or not, this engine was a race engine and it still had a uh, cast iron crankshaft in it. And uh, that part was running fine when it was shut down, but when I uh, magnaflexed it, it was cracked. So I had to get rid of it. And I replaced it with this uh, forged crankshaft, uh, Chevrolet forged crankshaft, 3.76 inch standard stroke uh, forged crankshaft, standard standard, which means the crankshaft's not undercut. For bearings, I used the Clevite uh, 743s on the rods, and I forget the exact number on the mains, 829, sorry. And the VX series, the V stands for high performance, and the X stands for extra clearance. I've already mocked it up. I've got three thou, 32 tenths of a thou on the mains, and two and a half thou on the rod, of connected rod clearances. So it's just perfect for uh, a nice engine. The rotating assembly is, I just picked it up uh, from Axis and Machine on a couple days ago and it's been completely balanced. So this rotating assembly could take 7,000 RPM and 600 horsepower, 700 horsepower with no problem. However, uh, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to make a nice street motor out of it. So what else can I show you? Um, rocker arms, full roller, uh, forged aluminum rocker arms, full roller style. And I'm going to get to the camshaft in a minute. Fluid damper, so the fluid damper is SFI approved. Uh, because it was a drag race motor, it had to be SSI by approved. You don't need that for a street, but it's a nice upgrade. And uh, a melting high volume oil pump as well. So all that stuff rounds off. We, we got the um, timing gears and chain with the Torrington bearing for thrust, which is the, sort of the right setup for that. So. That pretty well covers it, and we're down to the camshaft now. So for a camshaft, what I've selected for this build is a nice, uh, not mild, but certainly not a radical street cam. It'll be, uh, uh, it's a built for street motors. It'll give you a nice little rough idle, uh, lots of low-end torque. It's a Comp 11-242-3. That's 224 degrees on the intake, 230 degrees on the exhaust. 515 on the intake lift and 520 on the exhaust lift and the intake closes at 60 degrees after bottom dead center and that gives me a dynamic compression ratio right in the range that I'm looking for uh, which should give me about 8 to 1 dynamic compression and about 170 psi compression pressure so that's the design of the engine and that conforms to my my objective of making it a nice street motor that will have lots of low end torque It'll still go 6,000 RPM, no problem, and, uh, and be reliable in the long term. The other uh, part that I'm using, which we have here, is a Victor Junior single plane manifold. And for drag racing, that's the hot setup. It's fine for the street as well. I'm going to use it to start the engine up, but it may end up getting changed because, for one thing, it won't fit under the hood. If you put this engine in a Camaro or Chevelle, unless you have a bubble on your hood, it's not going to fit on your hood, and they, it's, these manifolds are really designed for, you know, six to seven thousand RPM is where they really work well. It'll be fine, but it'll probably end up, and if someone's, this engine will be available for sale, and someone's interested, I can put on any manifold that, that you want, and it will fit your application as well, but that's the manifold that we're starting it up with. So, so over to the heads now, we're kind of going around and one of the heads here, this head's actually bolted to my bench because that's how I changed valve springs. So I talked about the first 427s, 1966. These are the 702 castings, and they're actually 1966 Corvette heads. They've been professionally ported. If you look at the size of the, that's just the exhaust ports, and you can stick your hand down there. There's uh, plenty of room to breathe for it. And let me point out, these are the original valve springs that were on it. These were with the big 750 thou lift cam. These he these valve springs on my valve spring tester are 700 pounds pressure in the open position. So they are definitely not what I'm going to use. Uh, the valve springs I'm going to use are Comp 911s. And they are they're right here in 948 retainers. So that's the retainers. So a new set of 911 valve springs. And those valve springs will give us uh, 
120 pounds on the seat and about 300 pounds in the open position. So what I'm going to do for the startup on the valve spring is, in order to make it easy on the camshaft, the installed height of the valve spring is about two inches, just under two inches. Install height specification for these springs is 1.9. So I'm going to install these springs without any shims. So I'll install them at two inches and I'll take out the inner uh, vibration, uh, uh, the damper, I guess you call it a damper spring. I'll remove that. And by doing that, the, the uh, pressure at full open is under 250 pounds. And when you're breaking into camshaft, you don't really worry too much about the pressure on the seat, you worry about pressure on the valves full open. So that gets it down to less than 250 pounds. After the camshaft's broken in, I'll put all the springs back together, put the inner coils and I'll set them to the correct installed height. Uh, for every one, I'll, I'll, I actually created an Excel spreadsheet for every single dimension on the engine, every clearance, every dimension is measured. All the measurements and the bearings are done with the dial bore gauge. Uh, micrometers and when I do the springs I'll measure this all I record it on Excel and then I'll take that same spring put it on my spring tester and record the pressure at open and close of the valve uh, for every spring so I'll have full documentation of every detail of the engine so what else block head scan rotating assembly I think I've covered pretty much everything uh, once again, these heads are 103 cc's and that gives us 10 to 1 is the perfect compression ratio for a street motor. It'll run fine on probably 91, but for sure on 94 octane fuel. And we'll probably test both of them on the dyno. So now I just got to do the work, put it together. And uh, when I get that done and it's on the test stand and running, I'll make another video. If anyone is interested in this engine, once again, I am building it on spec. Uh, you can view it at this stage, you can be here when it starts up, you can be here when we dine with it if you're interested in it, and uh, that option is open. If not, I'm just going to keep moving, I'll get it built, and I'll deal with whatever after. When I go back to the Copo example, I've never seen one, but apparently there were even a few Z28s that were shipped from GM with 427 engines in them, and that is one thing that I'm kind of thinking of doing. Just in my Camaro. I do not have the original 302, so the next most iconic engine would be a 427. So, anyway, let's get it built first and we'll worry about that. Uh, long video, lots of detail to talk about, but I am pretty excited about it. The Almighty 427. And thank you for watching Gold's Garage.